Hello, everybody. Um, hi, um, my name is Bella. Um, I'm going to be your budget or discount Habiba for today <laughs> um, because she's unwell and can't make it, um, but I'm going to do my best. Um, so I work in marketing at 80,000 hours, um, and I'm really excited to be here for this uh, fireside chat with Ben. Um, so as many of you may know, uh, Ben is the uh, co-founder and CEO um, of 80,000 Hours. Um, he grew it from when it was uh, uh, just a lecture to a student society um, to the 10-year-old organization that it is today. Um, he's also the author of the 80,000 Hours um, Key Ideas series um, and the Career Guide, um, and he helped to get Effective Altruism itself started in Oxford in 2011. Um, he has a first from Oxford in physics and philosophy, um, has published in climate physics, uh, once kickboxed for Oxford, and speaks Chinese badly. <laughs> um, because we've only got a half an hour to talk to you today, um, we're not going to do a Q&A on Swapcard, um, but feel free to please submit questions if you'd like, because we're going to have some office hours later uh, that we'll both be at uh, that you can ask us about then. Um, okay, um, so I'm going to sit down and we can chat about it. <laughs> Um, so the theme of this office hours chat um, is uh, all about founding uh, new, new projects. Um, 80,000 Hours has recently um, updated our list of top recommended career paths, um, and we now recommend um, starting a new project in the effective altruism space um, particularly highly. Um, also, as I just mentioned, um, Ben has experience um, founding an organization that's now going pretty well, it seems like. Um, so as I said, um, ATK uh, just celebrated our 10th anniversary. Um, we're Y Combinator backed, um, and we're among the biggest sources of new people in the effective altruism community. Um, so I just wanted to start by asking a bit about your, your personal experience. Um, when you were um, founding 80,000 Hours, um, if you'd like to think back to that time, what were you like most worried about? What were your hesitations going in? Yeah, so I was choosing between, um, well, I was considering like kind of continuing studies and doing a PhD, or I was wondering whether to take a job in investing and doing the earning to give thing. And I, I had an offer and I, I found investing super fascinating. So I definitely did hesitate and we had a big discussion about which of those paths would be best, um, which was kind of like using the product that we were gonna design on ourselves. Um, and yeah, I mean, yeah, we were basically just trying to figure out which one would be highest impact and like whether I should kind of turn down this like pretty different life that I think I would have had if I'd gone into finance. Um, but yeah, after that, I guess I'm not sure, in some ways I'm not sure, maybe I like kind of unwisely didn't hesitate that much because I think I, I really have this sense of like these ideas are so important, just gotta like do the thing and build the org and in a way not worrying about it that much. But the other thing that really reassured me early on was we had um, a lot of like progress and traction pretty, pretty early. So um, before we went full time, we'd already been in the BBC and we'd already, we think, changed some people's careers. So we thought like, you know, even if we just do this and it never gets very big, we would probably still have like enough impact to make it worth doing for a, a few years at least. Um, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I guess um, having asked about the kind of, yeah, uh, hesitations going in, wh what are the things that uh, you think, well, you already said we had some early successes um, getting publicity, and what other things went right um, in the beginning? Yeah, I think one big decision that we made, um, yeah, we, so right at the start we basically focused on the website and advising, and then in 2015 we for a while, we focused down just to the website as the main thing. And I think that was, in retrospect, a really um, good call because uh, it was something that was like very scalable even with just a few employees. And it would keep, it keeps going even if you're not like ongoing working on it. And so I think bu building up that readership was, like that's the reason why 80,000 Hours has become such a big source of people into effects altruism. Um, despite like having a small team that whole time. And I think the other thing related to that was like apply effects altruism to something that people are really interested in already, which in our case was choice of career. And it's like the combination of those two, having online content about a thing that lots of people just care about in general that um, got, got us our audience. Um, yeah, I could, I could talk about another one. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, I think another thing we did well early was being quite slow to hire. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, we actually almost kind of, yeah, I think a lot of effect altruism organizations or just entrepreneurs in general, when you start a new nonprofit or 
or for profit, you kind of think, well, I'm building an organization, so the thing I should do is like hire a lot of people. That's kind of like the done thing. And we basically started down that path. And I think at one point we almost had like two interns for every, we had you know like two or three employees and we had like five interns and kind of realized that that's not the way to like build a really great team for the long term uh, fairly fast. So at that point we uh, decided to slow, uh, hire a lot more slowly and kind of make sure that um, like everyone on the team is great, working well together, gonna be able to be in, be in, it, be in it for the long term. And I think you know, this meant our, like, over the years our attention has been pretty high and we've been able to then over time like, attract more great staff. So it's kind of like you get a snowball effect um, if you keep the team small and, and really great early on. Um, for sure, that seems pretty important. Um, and I guess it seems like recently or um, hopefully more so even uh, in the future, we're gonna be like scaling up, um, which is pretty exciting um, from that like small core. Um, yeah. But I mean, yeah, I mean, it maybe almost sounds obvious, but uh, the temptation to just like hire more people is almost overwhelming um, because you'll have so much to do and you'll be like, well, I could hire this person and they could do this thing. Um, so like, therefore I should do it. But actually you kind of have to resist and um, kind of like almost like put yourself under a bit more pressure, but keep, keep the team like more and more able and be really, really selective. That sounds right to me. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask um, what are some uh, particularly important things that you learned along the way or that um, maybe you wish you knew when you started out? Yeah, um, yeah, I've been reflecting a bit recently on like what we would have done differently looking back. And I think one of the biggest things that comes, like leaps out to me is just be, try and be even more focused, do even fewer things. Um, <laughs> And I've like really tried to live by that over time and we have uh, focused down many times in our past. But even then, like we've now ended up with about 17 full-time core staff today, but we have four programs. So the job board podcast uh, advising and the website. Whereas like normally an organization of that size would only really have one program. Um, and somehow I think I notice a lot of other organizations in effect altruism doing the exact same thing where it seems like, again, the temptation to get another program going um, or like another product, if you're gonna use, use, use the for product language, uh, the for profit language is for some reason extremely tempting um, and you kind of have to have constant discipline to not do that. Um, so yeah, if I was gonna look back, I think one place where this went wrong is from 2015 to 2017 in retrospect was our most impactful period and I think some Significant reason for that is because of, in 2015, deciding that we were just gonna focus on the website, as I mentioned earlier. And then, looking back, that grew about tenfold our readership from 2015, or say 2014 to 2017. Um, and that's like then responsible for a lot of our impact today. Um, but then, like at the end of that period, we basically brought back advising, and then we br brought in the job board, and we also did an experiment in headhunting. And, that then put us into this uh, plateau for, from uh, around 2018 to you know, 2021. Um, basically because we were spending all this effort setting up the other programs, but before the point at which we'd reached all of our target audience with the website, and before we'd got to the point where there was like a web team able to just keep executing on the website, um, even if like I was focusing on other programs. Um, and yeah, in fact, the website team almost fizzled out and we had to kind of restart it from scratch in, in 2021. Um, so yeah, it's possible we're like coming through this today because now the other programs have become a much bigger fraction of our impact and the website is starting to grow again. But I think that kind of delay of around three years uh, was pretty, pretty costly. Um, and so instead, the thing I would try to do is just really focus on one program, max it out as much as possible, get someone who's really able to run it and then add another one. But that might take many years before you get to that point. Yep. Um, I just want to say, by the way, 2015 to 2017 is our most impactful period so far, <laughs> <laughs> as far as we're aware. Um, I guess there's like a lot of um, lag time in measuring our impact as well, because it's people's plan changes, right? You want to say yeah, I mean, in terms of plan changes, 2017 was the biggest year. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're now causing many more plan changes than we did in 2015, 2016. Um, but I guess I kind of, when I was saying most impactful period, I partly mean, yeah. um, I guess in terms of like my contribution or something, because we really got to like a new level of scale yeah. that now we've like held at. Um, and so it was that kind of investment for the future was the other big 
component rather than just the people we reach that year. Yeah, and know. as you were saying before, something that like might be generalizable in other founding contexts is that it seems like there were some early investments that continue to pay off across that period. Yeah. Um, yeah, nice. Um, cool, are there other lessons that you wanted to talk about um, from the early days of ATK? Yeah, I think a, another thing I might tell myself going back is, um, yeah, I think when people start a new project, it's kind of, it's intuitive to kind of think of it as like, well, I'm gonna like do this for a few years, which is kind of true if the project is gonna fail. <laughs> um, <laughs> but if the project does really well, then you might well be on like a 10 year journey, um, potentially more before you can get it to the point where you could hand it over to someone else and um, it go well. Um, and so it's really important to, you know, maybe whereas like for a few years you can just kind of just go all out. If you're thinking like this might also be something that you do for 10 years, um, eventually you do have to think pretty carefully about uh, like your personal boundaries and your personal criteria. And so yeah, I think one piece of advice I would give myself is just think more about um, yeah, my personal criteria. And, and I think one place where I made a mistake about this was uh, in 2016 we decided to move to California. Um, and like that's because like, we thought it would maximize the impact of the org. Um, I think in the end it turned out to like not be as big a help as we hoped. And uh, yeah, we eventually moved back to London. But I think the, the kind of like, the thing I didn't quite realize is like how much of a personal sacrifice it would feel like to move country because of like leaving my social life in London. Um, and like I also ended up like ending a relationship because of uh, that move. And yeah, I think in, in retrospect that was like a morale hit which maybe could have been worked out ahead of time by trying to really re reflect more on like what am I like willing to do. Um, yeah, I think, and then kind of like more in that theme is, um, yeah, like effect altruists are really like the whole, the whole thing is about maximizing impact, right? Um, but we do also have, um, everyone has like personal goals as well. Um, and if they like kind of pretend otherwise that, you know, they're often slightly deceiving themselves. Um, and that, that actually like sets things up. That's a quite a tricky thing to deal with in a way because your personal goals are gonna come up in work. It's not like, it, with donations it's a little bit easier because you can kind of be like, here's my 10%, I'm just gonna like give that to the best charity. Um, but your work is kind of your life as well. So it's harder to separate the two. Um, but then, yeah, I think one way you can then deal with this is by just being like super, super clear with everyone about some like hard boundaries for you. And so, yeah, I think um, Hillary Greaves from GPI is an example of someone who handled this really well, where she's just like, thing I really value is variety, so I'm willing to be director of GPI for five years, but then I'm gone, like, <laughs> and you've got to deal with it. Um, which, you know, in a way is like putting a personal thing ahead of the org to a significant degree, but because it's such a clear criteria, everyone can then work with that and like plan around it, and they know that the rest of the time she's just gonna do what's best for the org. Um, so yeah, I would have thought more about how I could just make my personal uh, boundaries like as clear as possible to everyone so that then the like rest of the time it can be really clear that it's like impact is the main thing. Um, I think that seems really important and is a lesson even as early in, in my career as I am that I'm learning already. Um, <laughs> okay, that yeah. sounds a little bit ominous. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean it. I just mean that, well, we yeah. we need to talk about it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, wonderful. Um, so I maybe wanted to move now to talk a little bit more about the, um, the profile that we've written um, about, sorry, that you wrote, um, about um, being a founder of a new effective altruism project. Um, and I wanted to ask you, um, yeah, just in terms of um, like advice that you might um, give or like uh, pointers for people who might be interested in founding their own project and what would be like the best way um, to like work out whether that would be a good fit for you maybe? Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm guessing kind of like everyone's probably heard the, the stuff before about what makes for a good entrepreneur. Um, I think like one one trait to maybe especially highlight is some kind of like capacity to get obsessed with your project. Um, yeah, I do think, you know, people kind of, they like, you know, the kind of standard advice of like, follow your passion, I think can be a bit limiting because it's ignoring like the, your capacity to get obsessed with new things. Um, 
so yeah, I would, I would kind of say like, it's about the capacity to be obsessed with something um, rather than like, you happen to already be obsessed with something. So like, don't filter out things too fast. Um, but I think like to get something off the ground, you do eventually need to get to a point where uh, you're like fairly consumed by, by that thing. Um, and so yeah, if, if kind of going, thinking about how, whether to go about it for yourself and uh, how to uh, figure out whether to go ahead. Um, yeah, there, there's kind of two approaches. One is like they call the bottom-up approach and the other is the top-down approach. And I think like normally the bottom-up approach is better if, if you can get that to work. So that would be something like do lots of side projects um, or, you know, if you, yeah, like if, if you're at university, like do something over the summer and then see if like you start to get obsessed with the thing. <laughs> um, and um, if you do, then, then you can consider like taking it to the next stage, which might not be like fully committing, but um, you know, maybe it's doing it full time for a few months or it's like trying to get into an incubator and like seeing if you, seeing if you get in, uh, seeing if you can raise a small amount of funding. Um, and then like at that point, it's then like, what's the minimum thing you need to figure out whether, what's the minimum thing you need to know uh, to figure out whether you should take it to the next level of scale again? And that's, you kind of like go forward like stage, stage by shape. You can kind of think about it in the for-profit way of like, you've got your like seed stage and um, angel and series A and so on. Um, yeah, but it's like kind of just like try and explore in lots of cause areas and meet entrepreneurial people and do side projects and then see if something grabs you. Yeah, um, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, is there any way that advice differs for somebody who's like particularly early on in their career, say they're like still an undergrad or maybe in the first couple of years? Yeah, I mean, if you, so a lot of it depends on whether you already have ideas and if you don't currently have ideas, that's, that's fine. And then I think what I would say is like, put yourself in a position where you're going to meet entrepreneurial people and you're gonna learn about the most pressing problems in the world. Um, so yeah, that could mean like joining groups at university. Uh, I mean, often people start startups out of graduate school and I think that's because that's a place where you can meet lots of people and have flexibility to explore things. Um, just going and working at an organization with entrepreneurial people at, within one of the problem areas, I think is a really good, um, a really good way to get those things. Um, and then, yeah, once you're, once you're more like, maybe you have some ideas, then you could start uh, like basically doing like small scale experiments with them. Yeah, do you have like an overall view about whether it would be better to like take that kind of approach of just like, um, yeah, go straight from university or, or grad school um, or whether it would be better to build skills in other organizations kind of before um, giving your own project a go? Yeah, I mean, there's like, it's useful. You need to basically, if you think about what you need to eventually find, there's like a find a co-founder, you need to have like knowledge of the cause area and you need to get an idea. Um, probably other some things, I'm, other, like, I guess, yeah. <laughs> skills running an organization. I mean, it is like, you know, the kind of like the young founder thing is a, a common trope which is a little bit overblown because older founders are actually like more likely to succeed. And also people who have knowledge of like the market are more likely to succeed. Um, so I think learning these, the, you can put yourself in a much better position over time. Um, but yeah, for an individual person, it would just be like, what's the thing of those that you're lacking and where would you get that? And so, yeah, you could, that might mean working at an organization, like a, ideally a small and like fast growing organization so that you're kind of learning how to run organizations like that. But maybe, it, maybe instead you need to go and learn all about biosecurity because uh, then you'll be able to start a biosecurity uh, project, which could be really high impact. Um, and then, or yeah, maybe it's finding a founder, in which case you want to like prioritize the uh, social aspect of, of the thing you do, yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, I wondered if we could talk a bit now about the kinds of things, uh, like traits in general, that you think make people like a good fit or, or a worse fit mm -hmm. um, for being a founder. Um, so yeah, firstly, I think uh, there's some stuff in the, in the career review, um, maybe that you wanted to talk about that make people particularly good fit in general. Yeah, I mean, I think the main one I wanted to mention is the like the capacity to get obsessed with the thing. Right. Um, and then, yeah, there's like, founders do need to have a certain level of kind of well-rounded competence as well, because early on you have to do everything. Um, though you can slightly compensate that by finding the right, the right co-founder. So yeah, basically the founding team needs to tick off all the key skills. Um, and then, yeah, and then, I mean, there's something kind of like leadership potential, but I think this one's a bit more ambiguous because I think kind of like, 
feeling like a leader can come from the obsession and the competence and the progress. And then that's often a thing that develops a lot over time. Um, but yeah, there's like some kind of initial spark of like, can you actually convince people to like that your project is good or to join you on the team that is like the, is, is an early test of whether you have that leadership potential. Um, yeah, I think I also mentioned like, would you consider doing this for five or 10 years, I think is another good thing to reflect on before like making a big plunge into it. Yeah, on that um, like ability to persuade people that it's a good idea, I think one um, thought that people often have about um, being a founder is that it requires a certain level of like extroversion. Do you think that mm. seems true um, or? Yeah, I think basically uh, not. And like a lot of kind of like the most famous founders in the world are like introverts. Mm. Uh, like, I mean, yeah. It seems like Bill Gates or, I mean, I don't know, Elon Musk seems like he often, he almost comes across as like shy in some contexts. Um, so yeah, it's not, yeah, I think it's not like, um, definitely being an introvert is fine. Yeah, I mean, I also personally would say I'm an introvert. Um, but yeah, the, I guess it is useful to have someone on the team who really wants to do all the like people things as well. Right. So I would kind of would say like across the founding team, it's useful to have one more extroverted person, um, but definitely don't rule yourself out from being a founder if you're introverted. And that like note about across the founding team is probably true for all the variety of skills, right? That like it can be. Yeah, I mean, there's probably some things where you, if, if like someone was like below a certain level, then maybe you wouldn't want them on the team. But right. yeah, yeah, you need to like kind of put together the portfolio yeah. of key things. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Um, yes, yeah, so are there any particular things that you think make you like a rather bad fit for being a co-founder? Um, mm, yeah, that's a good question. Um, like, a, you mean for me personally or just yeah. in general, like things that might rule you out of the thing? Um, yeah, or I guess any more general reasons not to um, choose this as a career path. Mm. Yeah, I mean, maybe just on the fit thing, again, it's like, it's easy to under, uh, underestimate with your founding team. Kind of like think about that, like going into like a, like a long-term romantic relationship with someone. Um, it's not quite marriage, but it's like in that direction. And so basically like ability to work super well with the people you're founding with is really important. And um, yeah, I always encourage people to try to actually like work with that person before. Like you wouldn't like agree to like a five-year relationship with someone just on the basis of like having a few meetings and being like, this seems like a good plan. Uh, <laughs> you'd probably want to date them for like at least months beforehand. Um, and I think it's like a bit similar with, with, with founding. Yeah, did you um, co-found a date at all? <laughs> um, well, yeah, because me and Will were doing this part-time for okay. almost a year before yeah. we started. So yeah, we kind of knew we could work together at least pretty well, yeah. I mean, yeah, obviously things will happen that you can't predict. Um, so there's always gonna be like, there's always gonna be like challenges that you can't anticipate ahead of time, but you can at least test it out a bit. Mm -hmm. um, I think that seems really important. Um, yeah, I guess um, we only have a couple of minutes left. Mm. Um, in that time, um, I, we talked about a couple of um, examples um, from your experience, um, but we also um, have uh, thought it might be interesting to chat about some examples from other people's um, experience. I guess 80,000 hours is pretty unique. Mm -hmm. Um, and there might be um, other kinds of models of um, successful. Um, yeah. 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 So, so one example is like someone. So, so Kuhan, um, who you guys might have come across, he's like uh, was running Stanford Effects Altruism, and he came across he came across uh, EA through eighty thousand hours, and that's a really good example of like the bottom up approach because he was kind of like, okay, well, I'm like at Stanford. What do I have access to? And he's like, you know, I I know lots of talented people who don't know what to do with their lives. And he like eventually set up Stanford Accentual Risk Initiative, which basically runs conferences and reading groups and fellowships to tell people about accentual risk. And um, now that almost runs like global conferences and they've probably told like thousands of people um, about accentual risk. And so that was like a good example of a kind of side project that uh, spiraled into a bigger and bigger thing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, early on I did want to say like the other approach to entrepreneurship is more of a top down approach where you're more like, okay, what ideas seem like they need to happen and can I do any of these? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, in the for-profit world, people are often pretty opposed to this approach and I think for good reasons, but it can work a bit better in the non-profit world because if you have a funder who's ready to back you from the start, 
that's often the, the biggest thing that prevents nonprofits is like not enough funding. But if you do have a big funder backer, that, that's already like your biggest hurdle uh, past in a way. And so like a really cool example of this recently was um, Alvia, which is like um, basically trying to develop like a new type of vaccine and do it much faster. And that was from kind of like surveying the bio-risk landscape mm -hmm. and being like, what are the big projects that we'd really like to make happen here? And they just kind of like got a team of, I think about 30 together in a few months and have like already started um, some early stage uh, clinical trials. Um, so yeah, you can definitely make the, the top down approach work as well. It's like more risky. Um, but there's, uh, as, as we know, there's a lot of funders in effect altruism right now who really want to start big things right away. So yeah, trying to test that out and then seeing if, again, you can get obsessed with it would be the, the next step on that. This kind of like from first principles top-down approach seems to be kind of the thing that charity entrepreneurship is doing a little bit of like going, you know, can we think of all the best ideas that we might be interested in that are being found, could be founded and then getting them founded from there. Um, yeah, that seems yeah, exactly. Like it's been fairly successful so far. Yeah, yeah and you can also do, you know, in practice, you might do a bit of both because you'll be right. like, you'll have the top-down ideas, but then you'll also test them. Yep. So, yeah. Yeah, it seems important. Um, um, great. Um, I think we might be almost out of time. Um, are there any last thoughts that you have um, on um, either the profile itself, um, the, um, yeah, the career path in general, um, and things that you might like to share with a room full of lovely EA Global <laughs> attendees? Um, yeah, I mean, not that much to say besides it would be, you know, if, if, if we're, if we just want to spend, like, spend the kind of couple of percent of effect altruism resources, then we need to be getting up to, like, deploying one or two billion dollars per year pretty quickly. And that's going to require a lot of new projects to be started. Um, so just like really keen to see people do try this, try this path, try and find um, high upside projects and, and test them out. And um, yeah, you can get like, there's a list of more ideas to explore on our profile on the website. And the advising team would be happy to talk to you if you're serious about pursuing this path. And I think there's a lot of people at this conference who'd also love, uh, love to talk about it. Um, yeah, just I guess quickly. So yeah, we'll be doing office hours at right. three and I'll also be hanging around after this in the like refreshments area on the ground floor. So yeah, if you want to talk about it more, just come and grab me there. Fantastic. Um, well, thank you so much um, for chatting with me about this. It's been super interesting. I mean, I hope it has been valuable um, for you too. Um, and yeah, we will see you at our office hour um, or later on. Yes.